really today what I want to try to accomplish is first um, let you know about what's happening in interoperability, uh, which is uh, for all of us in healthcare probably the most important thing that we need to solve in order to help become health systems around the world that have patient-centric focus. I also want to talk to you a little bit about what we do and how we play in the interoperability space, but also address what was stated earlier up here around the need for data that moves seamlessly across systems and means the same thing in both systems, and also touch a little bit on uh, inter uh, also AI and also population health management. What does interoperability really mean? For me, it's pretty simple. I have a bank card, I can travel around the world and I can see how much money I have in my bank, I can move that money, and I can be updated regularly on what's happening with my money and my investments. In this day and age, there should be no reason that I, as a patient, don't have the same access to my health information and see what's happening as I go through the health system in various stages. It's really unacceptable, in my view, after being in healthcare for 40 some odd years, that my clinicians can't even follow the, inf the information that is, is gathering on me as I go through the various stages of the healthcare system to treat different uh, diagnoses and, and different diseases. Uh, so really, it's, it's something that has to be timely. It's something that has to optimize the health system to better outcomes. And really, it's all about the patient and the populations. There's a whole host of problems that need to be solved, and we heard a host of, of issues up here and some great things, great innovations around lifestyle, around AI and other pieces. But the population movement has changed over the decades. Uh, Pre-pandemic, uh, we probably saw the world as a smaller place and a much more accessible place. COVID-19 hit, and all of a sudden we spent two years in lockdown and wondered what went wrong. The key is how do we as individuals move around the globe but have our information follow us in case we need that information in order to receive care uh, from a different health system. The other piece is unscheduled care. One of the things that always amazed me in healthcare is the fact that the health system never knew what was going to happen on any given day. They had to try and as best they could plan for the onslaught in the emergency rooms plan for the long lines uh, to get lab tests and diagnostic tests, and for those things that were unforeseen. Hard to believe that an industry survived this long with no intelligence about what was facing them on any given day. In order for healthcare and the treatment of patients to improve, you need the information. You need the data collected. You need to understand how healthcare is changing, and the only way you can do that is to share anonymized data globally. And right now that is happening, especially in the research areas where there are large groups of very dedicated individuals researching genomics, uh, researching cures for diseases, and they're doing it, be doing it because they have the data to allow them to collect a large enough population size in order to make some informed decisions and move things through both what they're doing for treatment cures but also clinical trials. And also, as a government, how does a government plan if it doesn't have the data to direct the financial and human resources to areas where it's most needed uh, for mental health services, uh, for those homeless, uh, for those that are low income? All of these things are, are are things that need to be addressed. Not long ago in the United Kingdom, the G7 finally stepped up and dedicated some resources towards interoperability. And really, from a perspective, 
This kick-started a host of discussions around interoperability and what it means for healthcare. From the G7 came the Global Digital Health Partnership, which has 26 countries. Uh, they work hand in hand in order to move forward with the very first use case for interoperability. And I would argue it's probably the most important use case that needs to be solved in order to start things moving forward, and that's the International Patient Summary Set. That set has all of the relevant patient information standardized, and the goal is to have that deployed in all countries around the globe uh, with a set of standards, and then have that information move uh, wherever the patient needs that information to be. And you'll see on the slide that there is a joint initiative council, which is made up of uh, a number of standards. Uh, they meet on a monthly basis, and they coordinate the work of those standards in order to start to kick, move things forward more, more uh, quickly in order to get the, get the standards in place to do just what the International Patient Summary Set is supposed to do. There's three key standards in there. Uh, clearly, we have a SEN from the European environment. We have the International Standards Organization, or ISO. Uh, HL7, uh, and more particularly in this case, FHIR, is really uh, the message standard that dictates what the payload is supposed to look like as it starts to move from one care area to another. We have uh, IHE, which is a standard for profiles, which gives more context and information around what's happening and what's coming across. And lastly, you have SNOMED CT, which is a clinical terminology uh, which effectively codes the clinical information and other information in order to move that information and have it mean the same thing in both systems. So here is just a snapshot of what we have in the IPS that is relevant, and the IPS continues to grow on a regular basis. Uh, but if I was a patient, my medications would be there. Key is around allergies and intolerances, because if I get hit for, by a bus in a different city and I'm allergic to penicillin or another, another medication and they can't talk to me and they can't access my record, then they may give me something that I may be allergic to and it may cause an adverse event. We also have, what are my recent problems? What are my immunizations? What are some of the recent results that I had, whether that be lab, whether that be uh, radiology or, or other testings that were done, and certainly what are the relevant procedures that have happened lately. In my home province in Canada, I have a healthcare record that is probably thicker than most phone books. My doctor can't even begin to go through it and understand what's in there, and in some cases, he doesn't have the time to do it anyway because he's only got 10 minutes uh, to see me diagnose me and provide me with some treatment. So this helps solve some of that problem. So this gives you a bit more context to what's in there. I won't go into it in any great detail, uh, but what it shows you is there is a structure to it. Is it perfect? No. Uh, will it grow? Yes, indeed. Uh, but it covers most of the relevant things and it gives I think organizations, something that they can start to build other use cases around uh, for their own purposes and to deal with their own catchment populations. So we, we clearly, as I said before, deal with a, really a medication summary, aller allergies, intolerances, problem lists. We even have medical device information in there because it would be nice to know whether or not I'm wearing a pacemaker if I collapse here this morning and what type of pacemaker it is. And as you can see, there are other things on the list as well. The key to all of this was the fact that one of the frustrations by governments was that things were moving too slowly. Uh, for a number of years, standards used to work in isolation and they might talk to each other, but for the most part, they did their own thing in their own space. And really, uh, the Joint Initiative Council was a first step 
along with the work of the Global Digital Health Partnership, start to get standards to talk to each other, those organizations, and start to work together, eliminate duplication, and actually allow healthcare providers the ability to actually standardize information, take a look at patterns within the information within their catchment population, and then start to look at, God forbid, preventive medicine and targeted programs towards the homeless, those who need mental health or, or other illnesses. From a SNOMED International perspective, we are part of a bigger ecosystem. We recognize that from, from our perspective, the clinical terminology is really the hub and through various means, whether it's mapping, whether it's including content within the terminology, uh, whether it's agreements to have extensions of other vocabularies uh, linked to SNOMED CT, it pro provides really a hub, hub effect where end users have a much more simple process in order to start to codify the information. We heard this morning that AI is a big piece of the future. I would agree with that. But we have to be cautious. And I think we also have to have a clear foundation mandated for AI on which it's going to learn, not a fragmented approach. I can remember standing up here probably 10 years ago and having someone who was in the very beginnings looking at machine learning saying, well, you don't need standards because we can do it all through, through algorithms but who monitors the algorithms? Who, who quality assures those? Is, is, in this case for artificial intelligence, is it learning the right things? Is its sources the sources of truth? And more importantly for all of us as individuals, how do you certify that the AI is working correctly and not going to make some mistakes that may end up killing people? So what we try to do and I'll give you some background on our organization. Uh, we're a not-for-profit. We do not sell anything. Uh, we're used in 40-some-odd countries around the world. And those countries use the standard along with HL7 and other standards in order to codify their data. I was a resident of the UK for three wonderful years. And the joy of living in the UK for me as a patient was the fact that I had an electronic record that I could look at. If I went to a hospital for an eye operation and they discharged me, I would automatically see the discharge summary. It would be on my phone. My clinician at the practice would get a copy of that discharge summary. And I was surprised that they actually rang me up and said, if you need any help, we're here, and we understand you're on these medications, so we've added refills in case you need more. They follow me all the way through the process. If I went to another hospital in a different area of the United Kingdom, that would be part of my record as well. And I could see a summary view, which allowed me to then make informed choices about what I want to do with my health. Do I need an intervention? Do I need to go see a pharmacy consultant? All of the, it allowed me to become more engaged and more involved in what I wanted to do with my health. And all of that was enabled by a set of standards with some very good technologies, one would argue, some not so good, that allowed me to see that. And hearing the panel this morning ahead of me, clearly one of the things that struck me was the themes were we need to see the information. The information needs to be the same and understandable in the way I, I practice medicine. We recognize that AI is both something that may be very, very good or something that may have, may have a very detrimental effect, but underlying it all was the fact that you need good data that moves without regulatory blockages in order for people to provide care to patients whether that be in the lifestyle area, the mental health area, or any other areas of healthcare. For us, it's been an evolution. So we have what we call an international release. 
the international release is freely available in a flat file format and also a global set format. We then started working with uh, HL7 on the IPS free set, so it's freely available to anyone to look at and to use worldwide, and that includes the HL7 fire messages as well and other applicable standards. We then moved it to more of a reference set to add more things into it and also make it constrained so it wouldn't overwhelm certain systems. And finally, we've released it as a free hierarchical set of codes that spans what is required for relevant patient information uh, as it moves across and around the globe. From a terminology perspective, one would say, well, and I, I look at the uh, the uh, lady who asked the question about the clinical care and myocardial infarction, she calls it myocardial infarction. Somebody else may call it a heart attack. The hierarchical nature of SNOMED CT is you can add synonyms. So in your case, when you see something come across in your system, it will call it myocardial infarction. If it comes across in another clinician's system, it may, may be what they call it, which would be a heart attack. It's very flexible, it's very easy to use, and certainly it allows the ability uh, to eliminate a lot of third-party solutions that would suggest that if two standards are, are in the same area, you need a proprietary map in order to link both of those together. That's not required. You can add the other standard as a synonym, and you may hypothetically get the SNOMED CT code as well as perhaps an ICD code or perhaps a LOIC code, a DICOM code. It just depends on what you want to use it for. So it's eminently easy to use and reasonable. I know we're going to hear later about complexities in healthcare systems. I'm going to be interested in, in learning about that one because I think every health system is complex, but the key is you have to have a foundational base in order to move the information around and have the systems have the capability to, to move it correctly and efficiently. I'm going to stop there. I've got about 13 minutes left. Um, I leave you with this. This is, this is the thing that we believe in. No decision without, about me without me, and that's where we want to get to. In this day and age, we should take ownership of our health. We should have be given that ability, and we should have be armed with the knowledge and information to make informed decisions about who treats us, what are they treating us for, and what the outcomes will be. Uh, so I will leave, leave you with that and open it up for any questions. Thank you. I'm sure there will be lots. <laughs> Thanks, Don. And um, look, I really applaud this piece of work. It's um, certainly something that uh, many of us have been advocating for for a couple of decades now. And I know how hard it is to develop international standards. I've, I've been in many of those groups myself. My question is, yes, it's hard to develop international standards. It's often even harder to get them implemented. Has there been discussion with vendors associations around the world? Um, and um, you know, it, it's okay for governments to say, yes, we want to implement that, but you still have to get industry alongside. They're the ones who actually embody it in their product. Well, as always, healthcare is a business. The interesting thing about vendors, and I spent part of my career working with vendors, is in the early days, they saw standards as something that was really an enemy of theirs because it robbed them of their implementation revenues. However, we've turned that around and suggested to them that effectively, if you give people what they want, and you may be one of only the few that are using it, then maybe you will make even more money and save yourself some headaches on the back end. From a organizational perspective, we have an invest uh, vendor engagement uh, part of it. Uh, we meet with vendors. We have a number of vendors, such as Epic, uh, Oracle Cerner, uh, and a host of other vendors that use uh, SNOMED CT within their systems. 
The question for us is, and what we're trying to grapple with, are they using it correctly? And what we want to do is educate, and we've done that over the past three years of having programs where we would educate vendors on how to properly use uh, SNOMED CT within their systems. Your point about implementation, we have an implementation team within our organization and anyone can ring us up if they have an issue or they have a question about how to deploy uh, the terminology or the IPS uh, within their systems and we'll help work, you, work them through that in order to get them to a point where they actually can do it themselves. Uh, we do offer uh, free educational courses uh, and it's a range. So you can start with the beginner course of SNOMED CT. There's developer courses. There's the one that I don't think I'll ever do, which is how do you author a terminology? Because I think I would probably break down and have a little, a little cry. Um, but we do offer that. Uh, so from our perspective, uh, we also work with the other standards organizations to put on joint education programs. Uh, in order to make sure that people are aware that it's not just one standard, it's a group of standards that work together. Um, but probably, uh, I would say the biggest roadblock these days is trying to educate the vendors um, because their systems are built on, on lines of code and how adaptable can they be. On the international uh, patient summary set, there is an implementation guide specifically developed for that. It's on the Joint Initiative Council site and on the standard sites as well. And that gives an overview of not only how to implement the international patient set, but what, how you pick the standards that you want, want to put into the, the summary set and how those are implemented as well. So hopefully that answers your question. Yes. Thank you for your lovely presentation. I've got a um, question for you. Um, I've worked with Cerner. Um, does Snowman City covers abbreviations? Because many times, working in healthcare setting, many people use abbreviations differently, and in many countries, abbreviations are very used very differently. I'll give a simple example: the word "right." Some people just write it "r" in abbreviation. Some people say it's "rt." and so on and so forth. So that Snowman City covers that. And if not, what is the future for it? Because it, it's really difficult for nurses like me reading notes sometimes. So one of the things that we've seen, and it depends on how you implement Snowman CT. So I'll give you a classic example, Hospital Italiano in Argentina. They have a bigger a bigger uh, set of SNOMED CT than we could ever dream of. And for them, it was about putting in abbreviations and other things as synonyms, uh, and let's take a, a broken leg. Um, they had, I think, 25 different things that you could use in order to effectively describe a broken leg. And the beauty for the clinicians in, is they could just type in an abbreviation for right they had already had that set up as a synonym and it would automatically come up as, as right broken leg, hypothetically. Um, so you can do anything you want with synonyms and each doctor can have different, different synonyms as it applies to their practice. It doesn't really matter because it's all tied to the same code and the, the same structured uh, text of what, of what that code looks like. Uh, again, probably the biggest thing that we need to work on and we are working on is making sure that the clinicians effectively should be able to, with the software intelligence, tick a box and the code's automatically applied. And we've seen some systems that do that very well and other systems that sadly have to use drop down boxes. So we are working with the industry to get them to a point where they can, you can just tick a box and it will say I present it with chest pain and tick another box to suggest that I also present it with cold sweats or, or whatever the other symptom is. Um, and that's really where we want to get to. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, sorry, hi, Andy Norris. I was from the UK. I now work in Saudi Arabia. But I mean, it was quite heartening to hear a, 
somebody having a good experience of uh, IT in the UK because we got a lot of uh, got a lot of criticism. Um, I mean, I have a, a lot of points about SNOMED, and, and I know SNOMED has been around for a very long time. And if I was being, you know, kind of a little bit confrontational, I would say, well, you know, you've been doing it for 30 years. Why hasn't it worked yet? And I, I kind of in that vein, you know, I wonder whether despite your well-founded concerns about AI, whether, you know, whether actually machine learning or AI or large language models, maybe that might be what this project needs. Um, I think, you know, we've heard a lot about, you know, abbreviations, different abbreviations, different things. I think, um, you know, I, that, that, that I feel it needs to be disrupted in some way. Um, the other concern is that I have is I think there's, a, there's an element of perfection being the enemy of good here. I mean, as a clinician, you know, in the first half an hour of patient contact, there's not, you know, most of what I need is not very much. Yep. <laughs> and, um, uh, and perhaps, you know, trying to get this all integrated across platforms and across countries, may, maybe that's not really the right approach. You know, where, are we, where do you see what, what would be an acceptable endpoint of this project? Well, I think, so a couple of things. I'm concerned about AI, but I'm, I'm, we're really embracing it as an organization. It just has to be done correctly. Um, so I urge caution in that area. In fact, we're looking at how it can allow us to be more productive and more responsive to uh, the people that we serve. It's a good question about what should the scope be of the international patient set. And it's been interesting to watch the 26 countries as they deliberate on that. And you're absolutely right. For nine, probably 98% of what you do as a clinician, you would need the patient summary for me as a patient. And if I present with something new, then you would code it in your system, but it may be a one-time uh, event for me and also for you as, as my family practitioner. Um, the goal is, is to use the, the international patient summary as a starting point, something that would allow all countries to have interoperability. There will be a whole host of other use cases, uh, but that's a different process and a different project that countries will, will, will deal with. But the key is, is to get the minimum data set in there to allow countries to actually move, it, move patient information around in order to make sure that that information follows the patient wherever they travel. I'm not a big fan of saying I need my, you know, 100 page medical record being fully coded and being able to move. For me, it's the relevant information that's the key. Thank you for the very nice informative inform uh, lecture what you have given. I have a couple of things. I'm a pure clinician, actually. I'm a consultant, pediatrician, nephrologist. Um, the issue is that actually to be able to have an international patient's record, we have first of all to encourage the local, the local system first, to have a local system for each country that where, wherever it, where if each patient is having a universal record, where if in each place where he goes he's having his information distributed here, here and there after his approval, of course. The other things, don't you think that not all patients need to be, I mean, in this system, particularly in this system. Patients who are healthy and just come for a couple of things, only small things, why should we take a part of the, of the cloud and engage them in the, in the, in the international system while, while, while they can be treated locally in where they are? Other patients who are really seriously sick and they need advice and they travel frequently, these are the patients who are in need to have their system and their records distributed all over the world to be able to help them and to find a solution for them. The, the other point which always annoying me, all these systems, unfortunately, they are so complicated that they, need, that they are time consuming and you know that most, most of the health services, I mean, in all the countries now, they are depending on the private. And in the private field, uh, how many patients you see, it is your value. So you have to see much more patients in order to have, I mean, to have good records in, in the hospital. So the system has to be easy, 
practical, visible, and, and even if it is all the system will be with dictation, while I'm into examining the patients, all the information will go to the system to be recorded without me spending more another 15 to 20 minutes to be able to, uh, to record the things to, to the patients. I, I, I completely agree with you. I think, you know, the final thing is we as, as human beings tend to over-engineer everything, especially in healthcare. And I think the goal for us is to get to that sweet spot where it's a help for healthcare providers to have data readily available. It's a help for governments to have the data readily available so that they can target funding to the appropriate areas. And we'll see what the future holds. But thank you very much again.